Hello YouTube and welcome to the Beyond Standards channel. My name is Shanks and today we're gonna cast a brand new replay for Battle for Middle Earth 2 The Rise of the Witch King on the beautiful map Sakura Forest 2. It is gonna be a 1v1 between Imperialist and his Isengard faction against Ave Have and his Goblin faction. Before further ado, let's get it started. On the bottom right side of the map we have the red Goblin player Ave Have and his opponent at the top left side is the green Isengard player Imperialist. This is the patch 2.02 version 8.4 by the way, this is the most recent patch right now. It's a great matchup, Sakura Forest 2, um, you know, it seems kinda small but actually it is a good map for the Goblin faction in my opinion. Because there are so many spots you can actually hide your tunnels at. Power point wise, Ave Have didn't choose anything just yet and Imperialist didn't pick anything as well. We will have two furnaces into the Uruk pit. And on the other side we have two tunnels into the third tunnel. No, he's actually cancelling it and building a spider pit now. Uh, spider links on this map are gonna be a great choice early on but also in the mid to late game. I feel like they are super reliable units of the goblin faction. Just like the elven units they are also able to get stealthed around the trees which is quite impressive. Um, Yeah, I mean it looks like... Isengard's player is not going for the clan setting, he's gonna go for the Uruk pit into the crossbow man, okay that's interesting. So he's gonna play really defensively early on. Remember crossbow men are one of the best tier 1 arches of the game. And they are a great counter to the spider links of the goblin faction because spider links are just very very weak against archers. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously as the goblin player you don't need to go for the attack. I mean, I also think and feel like that one spiderling all alone is not gonna achieve too much. So maybe creeping offensively might be a great starting point starting point for the goblin player Ave Have. Warchan has been chosen and Creebine has been chosen from the Isengard's player Imperialist. And he is just getting those crossbow men in position, they are ready to defend. So it's gonna be a great situation for Imperialis if Ave Have decides to attack, but I think that's not gonna be the case. And the Spiderlings are actually moving to the work layer at the right side of the map, Sakura Forest 2. And yeah, I mean Caribbean is also a pretty defensive choice, but kinda it kinda makes sense because Isengard units are stronger than the goblin units in general. I mean we are not talking about units like half Half-12 Swordsman. We are mostly talking about units like Spiderlings or Goblin Warriors. So you don't need to make your units stronger in order to win the fight. And I feel like Goblin player knows that. So he won't choose to fight against enemy units, but he's gonna try to take down the enemy structures. That's why Creebeen, which is reducing the amount of damage of the enemy units, is gonna be a great choice when it comes to defend the furnaces. Imperialist is creeping the work layer at the left side of the map, but at the very same time Ave Have, the goblin player is creeping the work layer at the left side of the river, which is offensive creeping by the way. And that's a great situation for the goblin player, why? Because this way the spiderlings are gonna buff hits level 2. You can see this is a, it's a level 2 battalion now, and this battalion is also gonna hit level 2. That's gonna unlock the self-regeneration, um, which is only available after level 2 or when you wanna build a well. Remember wells are only and exclusively available for the good factions of Rise of the Witch King and for the evil factions the recovering is only possible with the level 2 or with the banner carry upgrade. For the goblin faction it's kinda difficult because you have to build the armory first. Unlike with factions like Mordor when you, in which you can actually purchase the banner carry upgrade from the orc pits level 1. Alright that's gonna be the first attack. Warchan has been used and the furnace in the front side will be definitely taken down. We have also Whiteman of Dunland coming out of the clan setting now. During all this time Isengard's player was able to kinda scout this area and being able to take down this tunnel. I think the furnace in the back side will also be taken down. That's a wrong commitment, you need to try to take down the furnace, but the furnace is now gonna be protected. The builder has to be careful from Imperialist and will be just getting in safety. But he just still lost two furnaces. If he can save this level 2 battalion it's gonna be a nice attack and I think that's a terrible choice of running into the fortress range but it kinda makes sense because the crossbow men were blocking this pathway. And not only he was able to take down two furnaces from the beginning of the game but also he was able to save all the spiderlings he had on the field and oh wait a second this one might just die oh that's kinda unfortunate for Ave Ave it was a level 2 battalion and it, you know like I said before 
it will be able to respawn over time. Not anymore, because he lost the last unit. And also a great defense of the tunnel here by Ave Havi. He will be able to take down the enemy crossbow man because they were in the melee range. And you need to make sure with those archer units, you need to always keep your distance. And the e you know the easiest way to do that is when you want to have when you have like Urukai or Pikeman or Whiteman of Thunderland in front of them. This way they can absorb and tank the damage while the crossbow men in the backside are the ones the main damage dealers of the army. But I think he's gonna lose this tunnel potentially anyway. The White Man of Dunland with the pillage ability, it's a win-win situation. Whenever you are able to attack the enemy structures like this, you will be able, you can see that yourself, plus one, plus one, plus one all the time. That's the amount of resources Imperialist is gaining while Ave Ave is losing the amount of resources. That's why it's so important for the Goblin player to demolish the structures just in time. This way, the Whiteman of Thunderland from the Isengard's play Imperialist can't steal the money const you know, constantly. And on top of that, the Whiteman of Thunderland are very, very strong when it comes to take down the structures anyway. So you will potentially lose the structure, but during all this time, you will also lose a lot of money. Which is a win-win situation for the Isengard's player. Alright, the transition now into the Spider Pit level 2. We also see two, go two Goblin Caves upon the field, I think. We will also need some half throw Swordsman later on. Because Isengard is getting actually a decent amount of Wildman of Thunland now. He has a great protection with Pikeman and Crossbowman. So Goblins and Spider Links all alone is not gonna be enough to face against the Isengard army. And with that being said, I think the transition into half throw Swordsman is gonna be needed. Because they are quite tanky, they can withstand the damage of Crossbowman for a long time. Not only that, but also they are dealing a lot of damage to structures, resource buildings, in this case we are talking about the furnaces, but also production buildings, in this case the clan setting level 1 and the Uruk pits level 1 as well. And spiderlings, I don't know if this is a great situation for the spiderlings, because remember they are quite expensive, they cost 600 each, they cost also a lot of command points, and Isengard's pikemen are quite tough, and you will need a lot of time to take them down before you can go for a trample. Yes, you can always switch to the bow mod, like he does, but the amount of damage you are dealing with Spiderlings in the bomb mod is quite limited. And it's not as efficient or as effective as the Goblin Arches, for example. But I like the micro play, I mean macro play from the Isengard player Imperialist in this situation. Because he has units at the top right side, while he is also pushing from the bottom left side. The good thing about the Wildman of Thunland is... They are quite cost efficient, they cost only 150 each, so losing them is not gonna hurt you as much as losing Urukai or Crossbowman or Pikeman. And they are still able to win the 1v1 skirmishes, by the way, against the goblins from the goblin player Ave Have. And clan setting also got buffed in the patch 2.02 version 8.4, now it costs 100 less. So starting with a clan setting after two furnaces is a possible strategy in the current meta of Rise of the Witch King. And he's pushing with two of them from the bottom right side. We need more spiderlings, but there are no spiderlings to defend. That means this tunnel level 2 will be unfortunately for the goblin player taken down. And as long as he doesn't demolish that, he will constantly lose more and more resources. The spiderling battalion has been taken down, and he has actually he's making sure that he has always some defense around his own side of the map, which is very, very important. And you know, a crossbow man, Wildman, and also Pikeman are enough to keep the furnaces alive for now. There is a tunnel at the top right side. Um, Isengard's player is not able to see that just for now. The builder from Isengard's player Imperialist has to be careful by the way, because goblins are fast, and goblins are the only unit in the game that can chase you down. And your builder is not gonna be able to outrun them. So when you are not in the range of building a wall hub, your builder might be in trouble as you can see he's being chased down and he will be unfortunately for the Imperialist also taken down. We have some units now going for the attack, the, the tunnel in between the goblin caves is gonna be in trouble now. We have cave pads ready from Ave Havi which will be now used defensively. Potentially Kribin will be used at the same time at the same spot, but the tunnel is gonna be taken down regardless. Imperialist can still go for the vision of Falanzi which is gonna be most likely not happen. Because Isengard player normally is gonna aim for collecting 10 power points in order to unlock Devastation or the Wildman of Thunland Summon. On the other side, Goblin player was just picking the Tainted Land and was using it defensively. So it's a win-win situation for Imperialist, not only he was forcing his opponent to use his debuff, Keith Pads, 
and buff Tainted Land, but also he was actually able to take down the level 2 tunnel, the most important tunnel in my opinion, because it was in between the two Goblin Caves. Okay, so Ave Have, and that's the tricky part about Goblins and Dwarves. With Goblins and Dwarves, you want to be the one who's snowballing. You want to be the you want to be the one who is permanently putting pressure on your opponent. I feel like playing goblins and dwarves when you are behind is actually very very hard, especially against a snowballing faction with a great scaling into the mid to late game with like Isengard. The reason why I think Isengard has a better scaling into the mid to late game than goblin faction is Isengard has the strongest eco in the game. Like. You have Devastation, you have Field of Fires, you have Industry, you have Pillage from Lords, so you have a lot of ways to boost your eco. With that being said, Isengard's player might be in late game able to build like 4 Uruk Pits, like 3 clan settings and just spam all the time. And I, remember, Isengard units uh, are quality-wise you know, quality stronger than the Goblin Warriors units. I mean, I mean, I think Goblin player won't be able to spam only after all Swordsman, because they are really expensive and unlike Isengard faction, goblins don't have that much money boosting power point abilities from the spellbook. But yeah, we shall see. I mean, I don't remember the last time and I think I've not seen one time Isengard against goblins late game match in the current patch. The patches are changing the game a little bit. Isengard didn't got, I mean, I think Isengard didn't get any nerfs. The only change of Isengard I can remember is the fact that clan setting now costs a little bit less. That's a buff by the way, obviously. But the Goblin Faction didn't get too many changes either, I think. Goblin Faction is also quite untouched. Goblins used to be a great counter to Isengard normally. We shall see if this is gonna be still the case, because we have seen in the World Championship 2020 that Isengard Faction was the one faction which was performing always on the top level. Alright, the furnace here is gonna be potentially taken down, but he needs to make sure to not overcommit. Again, spider links they cost 600 E, so losing them is not worth it, especially for a level 1 furnace. I mean, you always need to kinda ask yourself, is the commitment worth it? Should I risk my unit for, for a potential takedown of the structure? And the answer will always be yes, when we are talking about a level 3 furnace. And when we're talking about... Um, about the possibility of taking down the fortress, obviously. But, you know, most of the time I see people over committing on a level 1 furnace, farm, you know, a Malon tree or whatsoever. And I personally think it's not worth it. Because a level 1 resource building in Rise of the Witch King doesn't give you too much resources. Especially this one, for example, which is so far away from the main area of the Isengard's player. This one will never be safe. So damaging it a little bit um is always enough because you can later on still commit to that when it's not protected and take it down for free that's why i personally think that you should not lose too many units in order to take down one level one furnace that's like a like a wrong decision in my book like in this situation for example we are only talking about goblin warriors they are quite cheap so losing them for a level two furnace is absolutely fine but losing spiderlings units which cost 60 uh, 72 command points by the way and 600 resources for a level 1 furnace is not worth it by the way we have scavenger pick from Ave Ave because now we can see whenever he kills enemy units he's getting constantly resources it's gonna help him out a lot we have shark on the field from the Isengard's player Ave Ave is command points kept right now he has two goblin caves level 2 normally a uh, goblin cave level 1 has only 1500 health um, a Goblin Cave level 2 will have double the health, I mean 3000 health each, and on top of that the units are gonna come out 10% faster, which is also quite cost efficient by the way, I think it costs around 150 or 200 if I'm not mistaken, so pretty cheap to upgrade, but you get 10% faster units, and your structures are harder to take down for your opponent. Charku is a hero we have seen you know, plenty of times lately, I think he's one of the most cost efficient heroes of the game. Quite impressive performance from Sharku lately. He's a great counter against clumped units with his splash damage. With splash, I mean, whenever he hits enemy units, he will be able to hit multiple units at once. And he's a great counter to Cav. In this case, we are talking about the Spider Links of Ave Ave. That's why they are forced to retreat now. 
The tunnel here will be taken down. Isengard is overcommitting now. Seven power points collected for the goblin player. He's gonna be command points kept once again. We have half troll swordman now coming from the fissure level one. On the other side, devastation was picked and used already from Isengard's player. He has a level three furnace on the backside, a level two here. This one is quite badly damaged and will be potentially taken down with the next attack of Ave Ave. He has now 10 power points collected, which might be used into getting the Waldman of Dunland summon from the spellbook. But you can also skip that and try to save for 15, which can be the Field of Fires, for example. And actually, I'm surprised that Ave Ave is making this many, you know, Goblin Spider Riders. I feel like Half Troll Swordsmen are the way to go. And maybe you need to try to get the upgrades purchase on these units as soon as possible because they are actually one of the strongest swordmen in the game and they are stronger than Urukai in like all situations pretty much because they can't get trampled down which is a great situation against Sharku so Sharku can't run them run them over they are dealing you know, tons of damage but we have a fight here now goblin player is gonna use the tainted land plus the white man of Dunland white man of Dunland was chosen just now from imperialist and he's gonna use it at the same place spider riders are coming for a trample you're gonna trample plus three plus three plus four plus four depending on the you know on the unit you are killing you get more resources so when you kill a white man of Dunland, you're gonna get less money than when you kill a urukai you will get less money from urukai than when you kill like a hero like shark for example so depending on the cost of the unit your opponent was you know investing you will get more and more resources i mean you get money regardless all the time and i think it's scavenger is the it's a great choice when it comes to constantly uh, get money because in this situation as we can see they are constantly fighting all around the map they are fighting in the middle they are fighting in the top side they are fighting in the bot side they are fighting all the time and i think scavenger is gonna pay off itself because it's gonna be active from the moment you pick it until the very end of the game and obviously it's gonna be much more valuable in the late game because the units you're gonna kill are gonna be stronger and more expensive so killing them is going to give you more and more resources. 875 command points for Isengard's player, by the way. He's going to build his second clan setting now. He might go for the Field of Fire still. Uh, let's see what he's going to choose. On the other side, we have... Um, after Waldman of Dunland, almost 5 power points collected. The tunnel here from the uh, uh, Goblin player Ave Habe will be taken down next. 500 command points only. Uh, he's not building any battle expansions, which is going to increase his command points by 75. 75 is quite impressive, because that's the amount of command points you are normally able to get only from a level 2 tunnel. A level 3 tunnel on the other side is going to increase the command points of yours by 100 each. That's why it's so important to keep those highly leveled tunnels alive. Which is easier said than done, because now he's going to clump against the two goblin caves remember the goblin cave level 2 has now 3000 health so it's gonna take him a little bit more time to take down and the extroverts are dealing decent amount of damage to the structures but not as much as urukai or pikeman obviously but much more uh, than normal archers in this case we are talking about the crossbowman from isengard he was also leveling up the clan setting the second clan setting of himself to level 2 um we have 725 and he has actually quite a lot of power points collected now he has 12 power points available he might go for the field of fires just to boost the eco to the next level one of the goblin caves is going to be taken down the second one is quite slow but i think the uh, spider riders are going to do the work now they're going to go for a trample and they should be technically able to keep the second level 2 goblin cave alive 13 and a half power points collected devastation was used once again Isengard has a great resource income. We have Lourdes on the field and Spider Elias was used from the Goblin player. Lourdes might be in trouble here by the way. Warchan has been used, he's surrounded. And he will be definitely taken down. Plus 118 from the scavenger ability of the spellbook of the Goblin player Ave Ave. Charge attack is being used from the Goblin uh, Half Troll Swordsman, I mean, sorry. Uh, but the crossbowmen are still doing a great job here. There are so many of them and, you know. I think they should be able to defend. I take it back because we, we now have Goblin Spider Riders entering the battlefield. Sharku is back in the business. Hitting level 4, level 7 is gonna be the time when he unlocks all his abilities. Level 7, the man Eza ability by the way, is gonna give him a lot of sustain. He will be regenerating to full health when he's low. And not only that, he will be increasing his attack damage by 50% and his armor by 100. Armor 100% means you have double armor. 
which is for a tanky hero like Sharku quite a lot. Because Sharku in this situation doesn't have a natural counter. The only counter unit you can get on the field against him are the half troll pikemen. Uh, but half troll swordmen are not bad either, but the problem is they are also not very strong against him. The only good thing about the half troll swordmen against Sharku is the fact that they can't get trampled down. But you can see yourself, they are not dealing too much damage against the war hero of Isengard. And Isengard is actually focusing on the map control quite nicely, even though the goblin player was able to expand now around the top side, so the right side of the map is kinda under control once again, but the left side, I don't see a single tunnel from the goblin player. So, you know, Imperialist, the Isengard player is doing a great job defending himself and keeping his side of the map clean. Uh, power point wise, he went for the Fuel of Fires, um, which is interesting because I don't see a single Lumber Mill just yet. Field of Fires without Lumber Mills is completely useless. Because all it does is gonna increase the amount of resources you get from harvesting the trees. That again is only possible with Lumber Mills. By 70% by the way. And Sakura Forest is also including a lot of trees. Maybe Imperialist just, you know, doesn't wanna uh, cut down those beautiful trees of the map Sakura Forest too. Uh, Sharku is level 5.5 and, and we have... We are getting more half, more half troll swordsmen, half troll pikemen and spider riders on the field, three goblin caves only. I feel like he's just making too many goblin spider riders, I, I also think that's not very necessary. Maybe half troll swordsmen are the way to go. Um, they are not a great counter against Sharku. Sharku can still 1v1 them obviously, but you can see they can't get trampled down. And that's the main purpose of them. Potentially gonna hit level 6 after dealing with the half troll swordsman. Half troll swordsman costs the same amount of resources like Urukai, they cost 400 each. And uh, the other unit that also costs 400 each uh, is the Black Numenorean unit from the Engma faction. Okay. Uh, by the way, a great uh, count against Clumped Army as well. We will have, uh, once again, the Wildman of Dunland summon, this time also from Isengard, play defensively. Ave Havi is still holding his Wildman of Dunland, which might be used now offensively in this situation, for example, combi in combination with the Warchant buff and Keith Bats. The Furnace here will be taken down next. And yeah, I mean, the game can go still either way. I think the, this game is not decided at all. So far, 800 command points for Isengard, 850 command points for Goblins. 11 power points collected, and Goblin player has 14 power points collected. With 15, he can go for the Watcher or for the Darkness. Both are really quite good choices in this situation. Uh, I feel like War, uh, you know, the Watcher can actually win one fight for you, but it looks like he was going for the Darkness. Darkness, don't get me wrong, is a great choice, but it's a risky choice because now Imperialist has 12 power points collected, so with 3 more power points he will have 15, with that he can unlock his Freezing Rain, which is not gonna only cancel the effect of Darkness, it's gonna nullify all the leadership from, uh, from Goblins, and on top of that, it's gonna debuff them by 25% each, damage and armor, so it's gonna be like a permanent active Creebane for the entire map, which is quite a lot. So Goblins are naturally weak units in terms of damage output and, you know, defense especially. And with the debuff of the Freezing Rain, they are one-shottable. So, you know, and there we go. Freezing Rain is gonna be used. Now the permanent debuff is being active and can only be negated once Goblin player is using his Darkness again. But that's kinda pointless now because whenever he's gonna use the Darkness, Isengard will be able to use his Freezing Rain to cover the Darkness from the map and kinda turn the sides in his favor. Sharku is almost level 6, but he was barely able to get away. I mean, he's quite, quite slow. Um, we have a wall up building up from the Isengard's player to keep the builder alive. Now we finally see some Lumber Mills around the map, which is very pretty much needed. Um, back and forth game all the time, we have a small fight around the bottom right side. The goblin player should be able to win that fight. The rubble of the goblin player will be rebuilding over time. He finally was also building some of these Varro expansions, building more and more tunnels. Um, he might go for the cave trolls later on, but cave trolls against Isengard is kind of risky because he has Sharko on the field who is quite highly leveled. Extroverse, crossbow man are all a great choice against the goblin, uh, against the cave troll from the goblin faction. 
Ave Ave was just building, you know, losing a builder. The tunnel is going to be taken down next. He has zero defense around this area, so if he doesn't react to that, the Vestition was used once again from the Isengard's player. By the way, he also went for the upgrade on the Fortress, not only for the Keef Pass, but also for the Armory upgrade. So this way, he's, um, when he's going to build the Armory, the upgrades are going to be cheaper. And with the Keef Pass upgrade around the Fortress, he's going to be able to increase his vision control dramatically. Indeed, look how much he's able to see. Like, he sees half the map, which is quite impressive. And I feel like vision control in Rise of the Witch King is super underrated. But I think it's super necessary, especially against those mobile factions like goblins or Eisen, uh, like goblins or dwarves. Because the main purpose of these two factions is to build those tunnels and, you know, those mine shafts close to your side of the map. This way they can actually permanently attack you from multiple angles at the same time. But with the upgrade on your fortress, you will be able to see all the hidden tunnels and mine shafts. And that's gonna give you the possibility and the chance to take them down fast enough. This way you don't need to be too much worried about, about a potential sneaky attack of your opponent. The goblin player is actually being able to defend himself, but you know, Isengard is obviously getting stronger and stronger, and he has 850 command points available, an incredible amount of resource income. No heroes on the field so far from the goblin player. I think Gorkil the Goblin King might be a great choice. Just because of the skull totem, which is gonna be like a tainted land, plus on top of that, it's gonna give you fear resistant. But not only because of that. I feel like Gorkil the Goblin King is a hero that has a great scaling. Azok is left alone at the top right side, by the way. So that is indeed a hero from the Goblin player on the field. But he might be in trouble here. Even though he's fast enough, he can run away from the extroverts. As long as Sharku is not chasing him down, or as long as Lurt is not crippling him down, but he's only level almost 3, level 4 will be needed, he's good to go. Almost 16 power points collected after the Freezing Rain, on the other side we have 14 power points collected after the Darkness. So both players are really close for the 25, which will be unlocked the Summon Dragon, uh, potentially. Dragon Strike, let's see what they are gonna go for, you shall see. Spider Riders are going for another Trample, that's a nice one, beautiful execution here. Just, you need to make sure that you don't overcommit, because losing Spider Riders once again are gonna give your opponents also a lot of power points. The, the way power points are working in Rise of the Witch King is also depending on what kind of unit you are killing. So when you kill half throw Swordsman, you're gonna get much more power points obviously than when you kill only Goblin Warriors. Same goes to the Spider Riders, when you kill them, you're gonna get a lot of power points. So you should always prefer or pri prioritize to kill the strong units like heroes, after all swordsmen, spider riders, because you know, not only your opponent is gonna lose a lot of money for that, but also you're gonna give you're gonna get a lot of money from that. The power points from Isengard are rising. He has already 25 and he's gonna go for the summon dragon. And it's gonna be used offensively and Ave Ave after seeing the dragon is gonna quit the game and the game will be won by Imperialists from Russia. It was a nice game, I think I think it's a perfect example. Uh, what was going wrong in this matchup? I feel like Goblin Spider Riders were underperforming. They were just not efficient enough. So he made the transition into the Spider Riders very soon. Maybe he should stick up with the Spider Links a bit more, a bit longer. Just use them for harassment. Um, avoid fighting the Isengard army. I think I think it's easier said than done. But when you go only for the Spider Links, you save the money for the upgrade on level two Spider Pits. Spider links cost only 250 each, so for once Goblin Spider Rider you can make more than two Spider links. Or you make one Spider link and actually make more half throw Swordsman indeed, instead. And with that I mean, maybe go for the upgrades faster, maybe get more heroes on the field like Gorkil the Goblin King, maybe the Darkness was a bad choice and he should have, you know, gone for the Watcher. Because Watcher, I think, is gonna be a great choice against Isengard. Because at some point he's gonna group and go for the attack. And the Watcher can actually nullify this attack entirely from his special summon. Because the Watcher, when you use it perfectly, you can actually take down the entire army from your opponent. The Goblin player, you know, rather than looking for an out fight and trying to fight army against army against Isengard with the stronger army, should be looking to fish some power points to go for the small trades harassment plays. You know, focus on the structures, then taking down, you know, focusing on taking down the enemy army. 
and then just stall for power points. To watch them could be a perfect situation because darkness, let's be honest, was active only for 30 seconds, so it was kind of useless. And also, um, the Wildman of the Unland Summon, the first one was kind of a waste. I don't know what to say. Uh, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, please don't forget to leave a like on this video, guys. Likes are helping out a lot for the YouTube algorithm. Um, i see you next time. You can also check me out on my Twitch channel, Twitch TV slash Beyond Standards. The link for that is going to be in the video description down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Have a fantastic Sunday evening. And see you next time. Take care. Peace.